Here we go. Let's see if that works. Yay! Great. So, good evening, or good, evening, good morning. Um, I'm here to talk about social cooling. For me, it's still last night, really. Um, I hope this looks better than it does for you. Yeah, great. My name is Thijmen Schep, and I'm a technology critic and a privacy designer. And uh, what that means is that I am both a nerd and a philosopher, and I'm somewhere in between those worlds, which is a very strange place to be. Uh, and I'm going to talk to you about one of the things that I've learned over the years and, and how I look at data and what we do with it and what effect it could have on society. I've also written a book about privacy design, so privacy is a big topic for me. And it's used in design schools in the Netherlands and Germany. And it's uh, something I'm not going to talk about today. I'm going to talk about social cooling. So what is social cooling? Well, I want to start with a question. Have you ever experienced this where you're on a website and you see a link somewhere and you think, I could click on that, but maybe I shouldn't, because that might be remembered and it might come back to me. That might look weird if I click on that, if people realize or somewhere it's being remembered. Who, who has that experience? They, yeah, a lot of people, people are aware of that idea that, that your behavior is, might be tracked. And I call this click fear or a click phrase in, in Dutch. And um, you're not alone. This is an experience that a lot of people are having. And uh, one of the moments when it really became clear that people are very aware of this type of surveillance was after the Snowden revelations about American uh, spying. And uh, researchers noticed that the traffic to certain Wikipedia pages was dropping after those revelations. For example, pages about terrorism were getting less uh, attention. People weren't clicking on those links because they were likely afraid that the NSA was tracking that. But that was at least one of the, the, the ideas that was researched by uh, John Penny, a researcher. Uh, and they also noticed the same thing in, in Google searches, where certain topics were less likely to be searched. Uh, so there seems to be this, this growing awareness about our data being collected and being yeah, remembered. And what does that do? Well, well, some people worry that it might create, uh, yeah, change our culture. And that's what I'm here to talk about. So this shouldn't be a strange idea, right? If, if you know you're being watched, your behavior changes. Uh, there's a famous example where if you put a poster with two eyes in the cantina of your company, people will be more likely to take away their trays after they're done eating. Um, and this became the basis of a prison, a type of prison design called the Panopticon by Jeremy Bentham. And this idea of the Koepelgevangenis in Dutch, we have a couple here in the Netherlands. The idea was that there would be a, a central watcher, it was very efficient, you only need one watcher in the middle, and then the prisoners would be on the outside, and they could at all times be seen. Their behavior could be watched, but vitally, it wouldn't work the other way around. So the prisoners could not see the security guards. So you would never know if you were being watched, but you always had to, uh, yeah, it was an implication that you could be watched. So you had to act as if you were constantly being watched. And Bentham's idea with this prison was that uh, these prisoners would ingrain the security guard into their brain. It would become second nature for them to always think, is what I'm doing right now illegal or not? Am I behaving okay? That was how he was trying to fix people with this prison. We closed all these prisons because they're horrible. People went mad from not having privacy and being watched all the time. It's not healthy. Um, but the funny thing is that in a way, with data, we are building this exact type of situation in our world, which is troublesome. Um, so don't get me wrong. I'm not here to say that data is bad. You know, I'm not one of those Luddites. I, I love big data. What we can learn from that, that's amazing. But I'm not here to tell that story. That story has been told a lot. I'm here to talk about the other side of the story, which is that Big data is supercharging social pressure, basically. Uh, that's one of the things that, that seems to be happening and that we should talk about more. Uh, and that's what I call social cooling. It's a word I created to give this a name to the long-term effects of living in a society where all our data is not just collect, but we are being judged by this data. And all kinds of scores are being made about us and predictions, algorithmic predictions. And people are becoming aware of that. And what does that do? So this talk has three parts. First, we're going to talk about uh, algorithmic judgment, uh, uh, algorithmic judging, what that does, and what uh, uh, chapter two is about awareness, what happens when society becomes aware to that. And we're also going to talk about self-censorship. And don't worry, the first chapter is very long, but the, the, the second two chapters are very short. So if you're thinking like, oh my God, this is going to take a long time. So we're, we're going to talk about chilling effects. Who here knows what chilling effects are? Some people, but not a lot of people. All right, so that's important to explain. Uh, chilling effects are this idea that um, people will be less likely to do something if they worry how, what that, how it might affect them. For example, after the Charlie Hebdo killings, there were a lot of uh, 
uh, cartoonists in Europe who said they were less likely to draw cartoons about uh, Muhammad or religious uh, faith and those types of things because they were worried that they might also be killed. Right? So it's a very obvious thing that people will be like, oh, I'm, I'm going to apply some self-censorship, I'm going to be more careful. And when a lot of people do that, we call that a chilling effect on society. Um, and I think what, what's important here to understand is that data is, is, is not the new goal, right? That, that's, uh, I love this idea that we've changed from saying that data is a new goal to saying that data is a new oil because it allows us to talk about this aspect of data, about that there are downsides to data, just as there are downsides to oil. So it's, I'm very happy with that, that shift. And uh, this allows us, I think, to talk about these chilling effects and how data relate to data. So social cooling for me is a way to, to piggyback on this idea that if oil creates global warming, then data creates social cooling. It's a bit of a pun on that, for a number of reasons that we'll get to. Um, so chapter one, the reputation economy, as I promised. We're going to dive into how this works, how the technical nuts and bolts of this industry work. And then we'll get to the other parts of behavioral change and how to deal with that. And that starts in China. So, so if you want to know what's going on, China is a great example of, of what you can do with this type of, of data to change behavior, because they're doing it on purpose. Right, they're creating the social credit system that you might have heard of by now. And the idea is that every, ch every person in China gets a, a score that reflects how well of a citizen they are, and it has impact on your job opportunities, your ability to get a loan, a visa, and even a date. And the idea, what they say, is that when people's behavior isn't bound by their morality, a system must be used to restrict their actions. So that's what the Chinese Academy of Social Sciences says. We, we want to have, have a very different way of looking at people than we do in the West, you could say, where uh, they're less... Uh, favorable to people having their own morality. They're more about, you know, restricting that uh, uh, actions by a more a bit of control, more power or, on top of that. The system will be based on various criteria, ranging from financial credibility and criminal record to social media behavior. So they're basically grabbing all the data they can. And from 2020 onward, onwards, each adult citizen should have such a credit uh, score. So, and yeah, this is old new because it exists now. So it's been built and it is real and um, you have all kinds of apps that allow you to, to check up on that. And, for example, right now in China, if you have a low score, you might not be able to take the fast trains anymore. Um, your internet speed might, be, might get slower if you have a poor sco uh, score. So these things are now really happening. Um, this is one example that I always I find interesting, which is that it's also uh, connected to dating websites. So you can even see if your potential mate has a, a good credit score, which yeah, freaks me out. Um, and uh, yeah, this, this is, of course, when it gets really interesting is when you realize that your score influences your friend's score. I think there you can start to feel that this is really powerful because you might not care about your own score and you know, have this attitude like, well, I'm going to fuck up my own life and that's fine. But if you have a low score that will affect your friends, then you really start to feel the social pressure of that, that system. So you could say that in China there's data stratification happening where you're more aware of people's scores around you, who you associate with. And uh, yeah, this is a practical example. Like right now, these are two nice people, but if I apply this, you, you immediately start to feel the difference there, right? You feel that there is a bit of a tension there. Um, so this is, in a way, the reality in China. Now you can say, okay, yeah, you know, China, those, those people are crazy, you know? That's, we don't do that. That only happens in China. But of course, the truth is that we are building the exact same things over here in the West. I'm going to give you a short video example that just, you know, ex describes the vibe of, yeah, wouldn't it be great if we all had these scores? trendy clothes and dresses. She's looking to catch her first lift from a rideshare app, but has no previous reviews to help support her. Aww. Luckily, she's just joined Deemly, where her positive feedback from the other sites appears as a Deem score, helping her to win a rideshare in no time. Deemly is free to join and support users across many platforms, helping you to share and benefit from the great reputation you've earned. Imagine the power of using your Deem score alongside your CV for a job application. Like in China. Perhaps to help get a bank loan. Like or in even China. to link to from your dating profile. Like in China. <laughs> Sign up now at deemly.co. Deemly. Better your sharing. Whatever that means. Right. So um, th this type of sentiment is also expressed here in the West. But even then, uh, like this was last week. Last week, we, this was on Slashdot. We're like, oh, two tech CEOs wanted every worker to have a permanent, publicly available job performance profile. Um, with, of course, a lot of discussions like, that might not be the best idea, but these ideas keep popping up. 
but this, the things we've talked about so far, these scores in China and this type of score is very visible. The, the reality is that we already have a lot of scores. And they're just mostly invisible, right? So we have these Airbnb scores and, and Dimly scores and things like that that you might, yeah, they're meant to be visible. But most of the scores uh, that we have are created by data brokers and we don't know about them. Companies like Palantir and EDM and Axiom and, and Cambridge Analytica that you might have heard of, Exper Experian. Um, so these data brokers, I think, are the big, the big group that we don't talk about, oddly enough. And we have to talk about them more, what they're doing. They're a blind spot. And what they do is they collect as much data as possible and create scores and predictions based on that. That's basically what they do, and that's what they sell. They sell those predictions. In America, you can buy about 8,000 scores for each person. Uh, and in Europe, it's a lot less, but still considerable, 600. And those range from things like you know, your IQ, your gullibility score, your religion prediction, uh, or have you been a rape victim? It's really very varied. Basically, what happens is a company might go to a data broker and say, I want to have a prediction on this. Can you help me develop a prediction on that? And they will, and then they have another one. So it's, it's pretty intense. And uh, important to understand here is that, that what these companies will say, that these, these scores they make about you are opinions about you. Right? So that's very important because that means that it's protected under the freedom of speech. They, these, this is, those opinions about you are not your data. They are their data according to them, right? So that's how they look at that. So when you say, oh, they're selling my data, be aware that if you ask a data broker if they're selling your data, they might say, no, no, we don't sell your data. We only sell our data about you, right? So that's an important thing to realize the difference. What I find very useful here is, is this taxonomy by Martin Abrams, a researcher who tried to yeah, explain the different types of data so we can have a better debate. And I'll quickly summarize it to, he says there are four types, the provided data, the so data that you consciously give away, like your email address in a form. Observed data, like your cookies or when you're on a CCTV camera. Yeah, we also understand that pretty well. But then the last two forms of data are forms of data that we as a society are not understanding properly yet. It's very hidden and, and complex. Derived data and inferred data. And I want to go into those a little bit to help you understand what these data brokers do and what they sell. So derived data is the simplest of the two to understand. It basically takes data and creates scores from that, and, and you can follow the process if you have a brain. Right? It's, it's, it uses common sense in a way. So if you tweet, Erdogan is uneducated, idiot, oh my god, lol, an algorithm might scan that tweet and pick up words and say, well, your intelligence is high, or yeah, et cetera. So this is an example from the real world where uh, yeah, this guy is, is doing a, getting a job, and then a, a background check is being done based on his social media scores. And then you know, he might have tweets like, to this day, this is still the most big dick energy I've ever seen in a video. That's his tweet. And then that's being labeled as bad because language, bigotry, and sexism. So these algorithms aren't very complex, but they are there. And you can, of course, manipulate them if you want. You could create tweets that uh, are, look good to algorithms. I've actually built a website that does that. Um, and you see this in the other fields, like you know, in America, if you I want to get someone to, to take care of your child, a nanny, then you might be able to get a score based on their social media of what they say and if they're a good, you know, likely nanny. And it works by, very simply by just having large lists of words with scores. And then, uh, yeah, those are matched against your tweets and then you get a score. It's these, so, so this is very simple stuff. Easy to understand, the right data is simple. Where it gets more interesting is inferred data. This is where AI comes into the picture. And where machine learning algorithms find patterns in society that we didn't expect, and this makes it very hard to use your common sense to figure out. So for example, let's say you have an app with, for people who have diabetes, and uh, these people also log into the app via Facebook. That means you now have data about people who have diabetes and their Facebook profiles, which means you can start to find out if people with diabetes have different type of Facebook profiles, what kind of things they like if that's different from other types of people. And you might find that, for example, people with diabetes are more likely to enjoy gangster rap and pottery, on average. Who knows? Yeah, this whole thing is you don't know. This, it's, it's usually strange things. Like, for example, uh, Hello Kitty is an indicator of uh, political uh, leanings. It's true. So if you like Hello Kitty, that means you're probably more politically interested. No. And uh, then you just reverse it and say, well, every time I see someone who likes gangster rap and pottery on Facebook, I'm going to assume that they're maybe they're also diabetics. I'm going to increase their li diabetes likelihood score to a little higher, and that's what I'm going to sell. So it's, it's really simple stuff, again, but it's how it works. And here's a short video that explains uh, how that can be used in practice. 
HPC was lowest, about 60% when it came to predicting whether a user's parents were still together when they were 21. People whose parents divorced before they were 21 tended to like statements about relationships. Drug users were ID'd with about 65% accuracy, smokers with 73%, and drinkers with 70%. Sexual orientation was also easier to distinguish among men, 88% right there. For women, it was about 75%. Gender, by the way, race, religion, and political views were predicted with high accuracy as well. For instance, white versus black, 95%. So here you see how these Facebook likes uh, can be used to identify traits about people. Um, and of course, the, 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 the elephant in the room is Cambridge Analytica, which is a famous example of, of how this works, where they uh, let people uh, do a lot of, uh, they took a group of people, let them do psychological tests, and then also got their Facebook profiles. And then again, they correlated and said, hey, people who are more neurotic have these types of things in their Facebook profile, and people who are more like this have that. And then they reversed it and, and tried to create a psychological profile of everybody in America. But let, I'll let him explain it himself. By having hundreds and hundreds of thousands of Americans undertake this survey, we were able to form a model to predict the personality of every single adult in the United States of America. If you know the, the personality of the people you're targeting, you can nuance your messaging to resonate more effectively with those key audience groups. So, for a highly neurotic and conscientious audience, you're going to need a message that is rational and fear-based or emotionally based. In this case, uh, the threat of a burglary and the insurance policy of a gun is very persuasive. And we can see where these people are on the map. If we wanted to drill down further, we could resolve the data to an individual level, where we have somewhere close to four or 5,000 data points on every adult in the United States. So that data was then leaked a little while later. And then here again, you see this, as well as data described as modeled voter ethnicities and religions. So, so these people have never typed in their ethnicity or religion, but the, the algorithms figured out or guessed the religion and ethnicities based on their Facebook likes and stuff like that. So that's how this works. It's extremely vague stuff. It's not you know, scientific at all, but it's highly valuable at the same time. Um, yeah, so, so then you get this type of stuff where you know, these psychological profiles about people and these algorithms are, are just spreading everywhere. And like I said, it, this is the important thing to, to, to remember here is that these companies say that it's not your data. They say it's, it's our data. It's not your data. We don't sell your data, but we sell our data about you. It's not your data. It's data about you. That's a big difference if you, that you should ask. Do you sell, you don't, don't ask, do you sell my data? Ask, do you sell data about me? Uh, the second question, they might answer yes, but the first, they might answer no. Okay, so this stuff is highly unscientific, as I said, and at the same time, highly profitable, which is why it's such, such a huge industry. I think another thing to understand here is that people still talk about data and, and profiling as if that's just being used to show us advertisements. But that, that was true in 2012, but it's 10 years later now, and this is no longer the, the, the situation. This is now used everywhere. Right? Not just the advertising industry. Everybody wants to have those scores and profiles. So the reality is that you, it's, it's more accurate to say that these profiles are being made about us for risk management. Banks, insurance, employers, government, everybody wants to have predictions about you. So what is paying for our free internet is not so much advertising, it is the, the, the democratization of the background check. That's, that's really the business model, I would say. Uh, and that means that there are now companies like, you know, uh, Crystal Knows, where you can just get an account and then you can get psychological profiles about pretty much anyone who has a LinkedIn account. Again, they scrape LinkedIn, create psychological profiles, the, the same dance. That means that your greengrocer now could, um, you know, have a score about, yeah, could know your psychological profile. That's the world that is being built, so that has been built. So it's invisible and it's huge. This market is really big. And already in 2015, according to the FTC data, this was already a $150 billion market in America. So uh, we don't think of it that way, but it's a huge market. And this means that you might apply for a job, get rejected by an algorithm, and you have no idea what happened. The incredible industry that's behind that decision. People just don't see that. They don't see the gears in work. But the truth is that we're now living in a way in a world where this is becoming more common, right? The computer says no joke is very much becoming a reality, or is a reality for a lot of people already. Now you could say, well, that's not new. We've always had social credit scores, and uh, we, you know, banks had credit scores. We've always had scores for people. 
yes, of course, we always had scores. It's just you know, technology rarely does anything new, but it, it supercharges stuff into becoming bigger. So yeah, it's, it's, it's deeper. It's everywhere now. It's accessible. Uh, and that changes the nature of what it is. So life has become gamified, and we just don't realize it. Like, we don't know that we're playing this game, most of us. It's, it's, we're slowly growing awareness, but from where I'm standing, it's still very small, uh, very little. And of course, this is why, why this is the case, because we all kept pressing on these buttons, which slowly created this world where our data is collected and judged, and it's coming back to us. So that's for me, is chapter one. Corporate surveillance, to summarize it, is mostly about risk management. It's not so much about advertising, although that's part of it. And our data is distilled into unscientific scores, and those algorithmic judges, judgments are increasingly influencing our life. That's the reality that we actually live in. Uh, so now we get to chapter two, behavior change. Right? How does this affect us? And that's where it gets interesting, because we don't know we're playing yet, but that's changing. That's increasingly changing. Like Every time I give a talk, I am part of the, the, the irony that people are becoming more aware of what's going on. Um, and this click fear that we talked about, you know, that's, that's increasing and, and growing. And, uh, for example, when uh, you see that protesters are becoming more careful about what they post online and what they share online and what they support online, uh, especially if, if the, for example, they have family in more oppressive countries, like, it's more difficult for people in Amsterdam to tweet negative things about Erdogan if they still have family in Turkey, because they're more worried that that, that could cause repercussions for them. So again, you see the social component of that, and that some groups who are more sensitive to this are, all, are already very aware of this. Um, so this is about, for the individual, a rise of self-censorship, right? And, or as John Penny would say, uh, a rise of social conformity. That's another way of looking at, at these chilling effects. It's a form of, of conforming to what, is, what ex you think is expected of you. So chilling effects, basically, that's, that's what's happening, uh, and that's what social cooling is about. And in China, they would say, well, those chilling effects, they're not a bug, they're a feature. Right? That's, we're purposefully designing our systems to have these effects. Well, in the West, we could say, well, we don't want them. When we become aware, become aware of them, we can fight against it. So there, I think there are three long-term consequences for, the, for our behavior. And I could say, they're in, I want to talk three levels. So individual level, societal level, and the market level, just quickly. For the individual, uh, like I said, there could be a culture of self-censorship that arises. For me, this, this all started when, in 2012, I was reading this article uh, about students going on spring break, break in America, which is this thing where they party and have fun, or at least that's what they used to do. But it turned out that a lot of students were not partying as hard anymore, because they were worried that the pictures of, pictures of them partying would be posted to social media. And then people would you know, complain about it, or their parents might see it, etc. So there was this social pressure to conform, to be less crazy, to don't experiment as much, uh, because yeah, you don't want to have to defend yourself later, so you don't do it. I think that that's, that's the core of the, for the individual. There's a, a bit of repression there. And what, what feels so strange about it is that is technically you still have the freedom to say weird stuff about Erdogan. You still have the freedom to party, but you don't do it because you're worried. Right? So it's, your freedom is not being taken away, but your desire to use it is, is lowering. Now, for the societal level, you see that, of course, when a lot of individuals feel this way, that has an effect on society, and you could say that could lead to societal rigidity. Um, and here we see the societal value of privacy that we don't often talk about. We often think of privacy as, as protecting your own data, but privacy has a huge value for society, because when people can uh, protect themselves and, and do things in the freedom of their own home, um, they can create new ideas and, or, or accept new ideas that might not be socially acceptable. Um, and that's why in society we often see that minority values slowly over time become majority values, because people can try things out. And of course, a good example in the Netherlands is weed. Right? In the 50s, weed was a drug, and you don't use that. But then it became accessible, and people started uh, trying it. And slowly but surely, you see that the, the mindset and the, the ideas change, and people become more accepting of it. And that's why you need privacy, so people to, to try things out. Um, yep. let's, let's not talk about weed anymore. Enough talk about weed. Yeah. And, and then we get to, to the market, so the business world. What do we see there? Well, here we see a culture of risk avoidance. That could be something you find where people are less likely to say no to their boss because they're worried that that could be um, 
yeah, in their profile, for example. Uh, so, ironically, it was Google who did research into what makes a team work well. And for them, the, the thing that they found out was the most important for a good functioning team was psychological security, psychological safety, which means that people feel free to, to say no or to say different things or to, to, to say what they are really thinking. And this is exactly in contrast with what these types of systems and you know, remembering everything about what everybody said at work all the time and creating these profiles, is, that's in contrast with that. An example was in New York when they gave doctors scores. There was, there was an, a, a long time ago. They, they tried this, and it turned out that, um, for example, if, you had, if someone died under, the, under your knife, if you were a, a surgeon and someone died under your knife, your score would go down. And that meant that doctors would be becoming, were becoming more hesitant to try complex operations because they were worried that they would make their score go down. So a lot of people who could have their life extended by operations, but it was a risky procedure. They were not getting, uh, they were still dying, just not under the doctor's knife. And so that's the type of, of perverse incentives that these systems can create. So even if they work well, they still can push towards a certain type of behavior. Uh, which we might not want. We want certain people in society to take risks, basically. And these systems are in contrast with that. So when we calculate people, people become more calculating, is a way that you could say, uh, summarize this. When, when people uh, are aware that their behavior is being recorded and judged all the time, they are going to be aware of that, they are going to take that into account, their behavior is going to change, and in a ways that we might not always enjoy as a society. That brings us to the summary of chapter two. So as awareness grows, people start self-censoring. This has serious consequences for our feeling of liberty, our ability to evolve as a society, and our ability to innovate. Which brings me to the final chapter. How do we deal with all this, right? And that kind of brings me to, um, all of us have to work on this together. I call this social cooling and refer to global warming because to me, this is a problem on that scale. It's a huge problem because we're all, these types of uh, systems that try to measure us and judge us, they're everywhere, and fighting it will be a, a large-scale effort. And I think, uh, uh, mirroring what we talked about before, I think the three groups we have to talk about, the public, politicians, and business, and let's do that. And the public, for, I think, would help if we have new metaphors and new words. So, for example, that's where it starts. So, social cooling might be a useful word to talk about these issues. I think also, when we talk about putting data in the cloud, it might be fun to say that, well, behind the cloud, there are the stars. And those are also being created there, invisible behind the cloud, but those are there. Let's talk about those as well, the ratings and the scores and the predictions. We have a long way to go, though. I mean, if you look at oil, how awareness, how long it took for us to even acknowledge the issue, uh, I think with data, seeing data as a new oil, as an issue, we're not there yet. Like, most of us still see data as something that's valuable, that you need to have a lot of. I think this mindset will change very slowly, um, but hopefully we can speed it up a little bit. I think for politicians, there's also important to understand that this has an effect on democracy, right? If people are less likely to protest stuff or say things out loud, that affects the balance of power in a society. Their algorithms are a secret while you are transparent. Right? So if citizens become more transparent and the systems that we live in are not transparent, that's not a good society to live in. Uh, or as Kuhn Frenke, a professor in University of Utrecht, calls it, we might cr create a democratic deficit with you know, understatements. If you, if you allow me, if we still have time, I would like to go into the big picture. We still have a few minutes? Yep. So, as a philosopher, I would like to talk about Gilles Deleuze. He's a, a French philosopher and who really helped me understand this, what's going on in a way, the big picture. He explains that there are two types of, of power in society. Social, social control and institutional control, institutional power. And the institutional power we all know, institutional control we know. That's like the, our government and our police and all these institutions that, that organized society. Like, so you are, you are free to do what you want, but you might commit a crime, then your police will get you, you go in front of a judge, you go to prison. We understand this system of control. But there's also social control, which is more informal, or it was informal. It's now increasingly being just, you know, digitized and thus becoming malleable. Social control is more about people uh, amongst each other saying, hey, there's some optimal behavior that we notice, we're going to nudge you and push you in the right direction to change your behavior. Right? A pastor might come by your house to say, hey, don't do that anymore, for example. So it's more subtle, it's more informal, but that's slowly becoming more formalized. And that's important because the differences are, there's an important difference between the two, according to Deleuze. So institutional systems, you are free to do whatever you want until you transgress and then you, know, you get in front of a judge and by the police. While social control 
happens all the time. Right? It doesn't matter if you're guilty or not, social control is always there. At the same time, the institutional control system might use punishments to get you to behave yourself, like you know, give you a fine if you drive too fast. But we all know like, a fine for driving too fast might actually be cool to get. You know, I, got, I drove too fast, look at me. While, according to Deleuze, uh, the social control system is much more powerful because it, it works on our fear of exclusion. We all want to belong to groups, we want to belong to society, and yeah, we're, as humans, we are social animals, so the fear of not belonging is, is very powerful, and that's why this system is potentially more powerful than the old one. If, and, of course, by wrapping it in technology as China is doing, this is a, becoming a very powerful uh, system of control. Also, the institutional system is accountable and transparent. Right? You can see how, what your laws are, you can talk about it, you learn about it, we, we build it together. Um, while the social control is often invisible, hidden, and of course with the algorithms we see exactly this, where these, these social algorithms are judging us are very invisible and not very transparent. So if, if you're China, you remember this, this little uh, event, and this is, what you, this is an example of the old institutional form of control, institutional power, right? the system trying to push someone aside, but if you use digital systems, that's very different. It's very difficult to stand in front of a cloud server uh, and say, hey, I don't like this score. Right, or this is a bad system of power. So you can understand why China likes this new type of control. Right? It's, it's much more invisible. I guess it's also useful for me to understand Like there is surveillance that we can fight against, and we have surveillance when you can film, for example, a police officer, then you are countervailing. But what this is all about is about covalence. This is about people watching each other. That's what's growing, and that's what's being weaponized in China. Right? So it's not so much about top-down, it's, it's also very much about creating a system where people want to watch each other. Um, so when you say, I have nothing to hide, when people say that, I, I totally understand what they're saying. Right? It's not a bad thing to say. It usually means that people say, I trust the institutional power, the institutional control. I want to help police officers find uh, criminals. And that's an understandable thing to say, except just people who say this often don't understand that the second pillar, the social control pillar, is now becoming so big and powerful, and that's the one we have to worry about. So, yeah, the old system, sure, but it's more, becoming more complicated, so this whole idea of nothing, having nothing to hide is not really uh, yeah, not valid anymore, in my opinion. So finally, business, what, is, uh, what could business do? Well, I think here we also have to create new word, words and new incentives to understand that uh, fixing this could be a business opportunity. Right? You could create ecological uh, data. For example, I work uh, as a designer on a privacy-friendly smart home system called Candle. It say all your data stays inside your home. So that's, and you still get all the, the benefits like voice control and all that. So you, we can do better. We can build systems that give us, uh, you know, the, the biological food equivalent of data systems. We can build those, it's just we have to do it. Uh, we have to see privacy as an opportunity. I think that's uh, something that I'm very much about and I love. If we don't, then we might get this type of situation where the government steps in and, uh, and our products will get these types of labels or, you know, if we're honest, you know, this would be even <laughs> more fair. Right, so, I think that, that's something that, that uh, we could do, that we could change. And finally, us, you know, as, as a group here, um, this is also about a new mindset, right? About a new way of, of looking at things. I think stop saying, that, stop saying that we have nothing to hide. We really have to stop that. I think I hope I have helped you a little bit to understand what privacy is or that, that my talk allows you to understand that privacy is not so much about hiding your data. It's privacy is the right to be imperfect. That's what privacy is. Right? In a system, in a world where there are so many systems and pressures to conform uh, through these digital systems, this is really what privacy is all about. About you know, doing things differently, trying new things in the comfort of your own home, in safety. And uh, that's important to have for democracy, for people as individuals. So when people say, well, privacy was just a phase, you know, it was like the ebb and flood and it goes away again, I'm like, are you crazy? Y you don't say women's rights were just a phase, right? Well, these are things that we've fought for, that we finally have privacy, let's not throw it away. Of course, Edward Snowden says it the best when he says, arguing that you don't care about the right to privacy because you have nothing to hide is no different than saying you don't care about free speech because you have nothing to say. Right? Most eloquent system admin of all time. Um, so I'm, what I'm preaching is nuance, right? I'm saying, I, yes, I don't hate data, I don't hate big data, but we really have to look at it more nuance, in a nuanced way and say, well, we have to stop saying data is great, data is progress. We have to stop that narrative and say, well, data is a trade-off. There are good sides, but there are definitely bad sides that we have to deal with. And in that sense, we, you know, data really is the new oil. It really has a lot of downsides that we have to address together as a society. 
So that's what social cooling is, is hopefully a useful word for, a way to talk about these long-term chilling effects and how that might change our behavior if, we don't, if we're not careful uh, and we don't want to become like China or more like China. Um, if we don't think more critically about this stuff, we might end up with a world that's more well-behaved, but also maybe less human. So that's my talk. Thank you. Thank you very much, Timon. Those were some definite Black Mirror vibes at points, <laughs> but also something really good to think about. So, up next, I think after these two talks, we can all use a drink. So, we have a coffee break now until, um, until uh, let me look at the schedule, <laughs> until 11.20. So, go get a cup of coffee, get a cup of tea, a glass of water, something like that. And don't forget the speed meet. It is um, at the near the entrance where you got your goodie bag, so if you feel like participating, just go there and Artu will, will uh, tell you how it works. See you all in a bit. <laughs>